So once again, a big shout out to everyone in Pentaville Prison. Uh, we are thinking of you today because it actually says in the Bible, it says, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. So we're thinking of you today as we talk about the Father heart of God. And did you know there's a link between prison and the Father heart of God? Because loads of studies have been done over the years showing that if you grew up without your biological dad, you're more likely to end up in prison. And what people have found is that there's a big link between if you had a loving dad in the home with you and if you end up going to prison, if you end up getting involved in crime. And what we found again and again through people studying this is that people need good fathers. People need a good relationship with their dad. But what we also see is a breakdown of good relationships with dads, right? And so what we all badly need, we need good relationships with our fathers. And ultimately, we need a good relationship with Father God, because God is the most perfect dad. He's the most perfect father. And even if you didn't grow up with your biological dad, or even if you had a really bad dad, you can actually get a lot of healing from that by getting to know more about the father heart of God. So that's what we're going to look at today. But first, let me just ask you this question. Do you feel like you're the apple of God's eye? Do you feel like you are always the apple of God's eye? What about when you just do something wrong that you know God doesn't approve of? Do you still feel like you're the apple of God's eye? Well, that's what we're going to look at today about being the apple of God's eye. So let's jump into it, right? we're going to go to Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, right? So check it out. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 9, For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. In a desert land he found him, in a barren and howling waste. He shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. So right here, what you've got is a description of God, the father, fathering his children, fathering his people. And the way he views his children is as the apple of his eye. Right there. God views his children as the apple of his eye, okay? Now, you might find that when you grew up, you didn't feel like you were the apple of your dad's eye. Maybe he wasn't even around in your life, so you definitely didn't feel like you were the apple of his eye. You didn't feel like you were really special to him, right? And and maybe you didn't have your dad protect you and watch over you. Maybe your dad was even harmful to you and actually hurt you. And so it's hard to feel like you were the the apple of your father's eye. And when you hear about Father God, it can sometimes be hard to get that you could be the apple of Father God's eye. But that's how he's described in the Bible as a father who his people are the apple of his eye. So much so that look what it says in verse 10. He shielded him. So this is talking about God the Father shielding his people. He's the kind of father who says, you're the apple of my eye. I'm going to shield you like nothing else, right? Uh, He cares for them. He cares for them like nothing else because his people are the apple of his eye. He guards them as the apple of his eye. And the imagery you've got in verse 11 is of an eagle, an eagle that looks after its young, that looks after its children, that uses its wings to protect them. It's an eagle who's present to protect It's children. And that's what Father God is like with any of his children. He sees you as the apple of his eye and he wants to protect you because you are the apple of his eye. Now, another way of looking at this is in Exodus 19, verse 5. It says, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. So here you've got the language of being God's treasured possession. If you're one of God's people, you are his treasured possession. Now, I just want you to think about when you were growing up, either your dad or your guardian 
whoever was looking after you when you were growing up, what was their treasured possession? It might be an object in the home that was their treasured possession that you knew that is the most important thing to them. It might even be a substance. If you had a parent who was addicted to alcohol, you might be like, their treasured possession was a can of beer. Now, maybe you had a, a dad who you felt like you were your dad's treasure possession, apart from when they had the football on. And then suddenly you would be totally ignored, no matter what. And so you might have grown up with ways where you feel like sometimes I'm a treasure possession, sometimes I'm not. What we've got to learn and keep getting into our heads is the fact that if you're one of God's children, you are his treasured possession. Maybe one of you one day broke something in the home that was your dad's treasured possession and he went nuts and it made you think that objects were more important than people. Well, it's not like that with Father God. You are his treasured possession. In fact, if we go back to that previous passage, Deuteronomy 32, in verse 9, it says, for the Lord's portion is his what? His people. So when the land was being divided up and people were being told, this is your tribe's inheritance, you get this land here, and your tribe, you get this inheritance here, it then said, God, he doesn't inherit any land. God's inheritance is people. His portion is his people. Because God's like, look, I don't want land. I want people. He's that kind of father. He's like, land is not my treasured possession. People are my treasured possession. But you might have noticed a catch here, right? Verse five, look at the first half of it. It says, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. So you might be like, oh, hang on a minute. I can only be God's treasured possession if I obey him, if I obey his 10 commandments. And you're like, do not lie. Uh, okay. <laughs> Who's ever lied here before? We've all lied, right? If, if anyone doesn't put their hand up, I'm sorry, we've just caught you in a lie. So you need to now put your hand up, right? We've all lied, okay? Um, steal, you know, kill. We all break God's command. So how can we still be God's treasured possession? Well, check it out. Remember last week, we talked about how everything you do in life in some ways, it's like you get a report card of it. And you know, teachers at school give you ticks when you did get stuff right, and they give you X's when you get stuff wrong, right? And if you want, you could imagine here on the screen, the circle on the left is like your report card. All humans report cards of how well they've done with the Ten Commandments. And every time they've broken one of the Ten Commandments, it's written down somewhere. For all of us, every time we've broken the Ten Commandments, there's a, there's a record of that somewhere, kind of. And here's the thing. Jesus Christ came, and he never broke any of the Ten Commandments. His record doesn't have any X's on it. All it has is ticks, because he got everything right. He did everything right. He lived a perfectly righteous life. And at the cross, he did swapsies with us. And he said, I'm going to swap your report card for my report card, your record of wrong for my record of right. And now you are holy and blameless in God's sight. That's what Jesus did for us. So Jesus is the one who kept God's covenant in our place, which means we can be God's treasured possession, not because of our performance, but because of Christ's performance. So if you've ever felt like, oh, you know what, right now, yeah, I'm feeling it. I'm God's treasured possession. And then you get in an argument with someone, you say some things, you know, you shouldn't have said. And later you're like, oh man, I bet, you know, God's really unhappy with me now. I'm not really very special to him right now anymore. That's not true. Because if you believe in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ never got in that argument and did those bad, said those bad things you said. Instead, he lived a righteous life that's credited to your account. He's kept the covenant. You are Father God's treasured possession. All right, here's another way of viewing it, yeah? John 3, 16, it says this in the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is what God did. 
He, he said, I'm going to send my son so that you don't have to perish. You don't have to be condemned for breaking any of the Ten Commandments. Instead, you can have eternal life because of what my son is going to do at the cross. And the son went willingly into this. The son's like, yes, let's do this. This is a plan to save people. Now, notice it says, for God so loved the world. Well, are you in the world? Yeah, 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 we're all in the world, right? We're not on Mars right now or the moon. We're in the world, right? We're in the world. So I want you to do this. I just, I want you to, to yourself, to put your name in here. For God so loved blank. Put your name in there. God so loved your name that he gave his one and only son that your name shall not perish but have eternal life. That's how much God loves you. That's how special you are. That's how valued you are by Father God. He so loved you, your name, that he gave his one and only son that you, your name, shall not perish but have eternal life. Can I suggest to you that this week, meditate on this. Write this down somewhere, put your name in that, and every day, read it out loud to yourself and renew your mind about how much God loves you and how special you are to him. We've got much more to look at this in the, in the coming weeks. You might have some questions about this and all that, but for now, we're just going to leave it there. I just want you to get that if you believe in Jesus Christ, because of what Jesus did at the cross, you are God's treasure possession. You are that apple of his eye. And don't let anyone tell you anything different. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that we are your treasured possession, the apple of your eye. We thank you so much that you love us so much that you sent your son for us. Jesus Christ, we praise you and we thank you for coming willingly, making a sacrifice willingly at the cross so that we could get your record of right, so that you could take our record of wrong and wipe it out. And we thank you so much that you kept the covenant in our place. You kept the Ten Commandments in our place. We thank you so much that we got your righteousness, that we can be God's treasured possession. Holy Spirit, help us to meditate on this throughout the week. Renew our minds and help us to relate to Father God better as his treasured possession. In Jesus' name, amen.